Two million years ago, we looked just a bit different. We weren't Homo sapiens, we were Homo erectus. Fast forward 1.7 million years, or about 300,000 years ago, and we evolve. We called ourselves Homo neanderthals. And here we are now, Homo sapiens, appearing quite recently. Despite the diversity of our Homo sapiens species, have you ever wondered why we don't have those other human species? Why are all the previous guys gone? And how is it that we, with our gene pool, survived? If you listen to most scientists, Homo sapiens first appeared on Earth around 140,000 years ago. We weren't the smartest, strongest, or naturally more advantageous species for the conditions at the time. At first glance, we seem to be at a major disadvantage, but we had three key things going for us that separated us from everyone else. Our natural sense of curiosity, our collaborative nature, and language. Language enabled us to communicate 10,000 times faster than any other species on Earth, improving our collaboration. Combined with our curiosity, we were able to exponentially accelerate our development. We discovered how to make fire, and then the wheel came along, and then machinery, and then electricity, and I think you get the idea, the trend continues. With each discovery, we are able to speed up our progression more and more. All of these are significant, but the one invention that truly skyrocketed our progression was the computer. Almost everything we do today is driven by these devices. The craziest thing about this is, is that the computer has just triggered the beginning of extreme innovation, taking us from point zero to where we are now. We are at a wall and soon a product is going to come out that will be the next computer, breaking the barrier and sending us towards the direction of the technological singularity and towards becoming super powered human beings. But what is this innovation? Before I reveal the name, I want to tell you a story of a man that we'll call Tom. In 2019, Tom survived a tragic accident that left him paralyzed from the waist down. The boy that was once on his way to becoming a potential track star now lives his life wincing in pain. Paralyzation and amputation is an unfortunate reality for so many people every year. Both Tom and many others like him will never get to use their full physical capabilities unless something radical is done to fix this. Our health is the backbone of what makes us, us. But we aren't perfect creatures, and as demonstrated with Tom, not everyone gets to live their perfect, healthy, best life. But what if there was a way to give back sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf, and movement to the paralyzed? Let's take a look at our brains. As an example, for most people, moving doesn't really require any effort. When you go to pick something up, your brain takes care of all the details. All the work is handed off to the neurons, which transmit nerve impulses. Your brain knows just where these signals need to be sent. However, when someone loses a limb through paralysis or amputation, the pathways these signals move through become lost. The electrical impulses are blocked from reaching their final destination. What if there was a way to fix this? Let's take a look at another issue. What about sleep? There are millions out there who suffer from sleep problems. What if there was a way to tamper with our brainwaves so that we could fall asleep quicker and with more quality? What about another issue like epilepsy? What if there was a way to stimulate certain brainwaves so that we could help mitigate seizures? This is where our next computer comes in. Brain-computer interfaces, or BCIs, can be used to create new pathways for these impulses. So let's take a step back. Just what is a BCI? In a nutshell, we're trying to connect mind to machine. The intention is to combine technologies like electrodes with external computing devices to obtain some sort of desired output, like an action. Electrodes can be placed in close proximity or onto the gray matter of the brain, creating a new neural network for the chemical and electrical signals our neurons communicate with to follow. These signals could be measured and modified with the help of the computer, which would read the data and perform the task we desired. Of course, this technology is still extremely new and there are likely to be other methods that could potentially achieve the same goal, such as implants or something like neural lace, which is a mesh made up of a collection of electrodes that are rolled up and inserted into the skull using a needle, later unraveling and spanning the brain. But why did I tell you that whole story about Tom then? Well, if we could connect a prosthetic to a brain computer interface, it could be possible to move a prosthetic limb by just thinking about it. Crazy. This isn't 5,000 years away either. In fact, this technology is already being used. 
Johnny Matney lost his arm to cancer in 2008, and by using a DARPA-funded Bluetooth-based prosthetic, he's able to move his arm just by thinking about it. He's literally freaking able to hold his wife's hand. That's crazy. And if this tech can do this, then what else can it do? There are so many possibilities. What if we were able to place microelectrodes along optic nerves and use bionic eyes and cameras to replicate vision for the blind or impaired? Or use EEG headsets and eventually implants to help control brainwaves, dealing with issues like muscular dystrophy? Those are just some of the medical innovations that this technology has the potential to unlock. But going even further and looking at the more casual sci-fi-esque side of things, it could be possible that once this tech advances enough, we could turn on the lights in our homes just by thinking about them. Kind of like a Brain X smart home interface. The thing that we must recognize is that BCIs are a very new innovation and need a lot of work. If done correctly, they're likely to disrupt the future as we know it. However, there are a lot of ethical issues that come along through their production. Is it ethical to play God and try to turn ourselves into these superpowered human beings? By investing into these technologies, we are fundamentally modifying who we are as human beings. We're truly merging our minds with machines and merging with biotechnology. When you look at the benefits, it makes sense to pursue BCIs. For example, although things like disease and disabilities are natural, they do not impact everyone in the same way. It's not fair. People's lives, as of Tom's earlier, are made fundamentally more difficult because of a factor that they cannot often control. Why wouldn't we want to fix and improve the lives of these people? Or even just improve the quality of our own lives? The thing is, once we enable brain-computer interfaces for disease, then eventually we'll start implementing it for other less essential things. It might become the expected norm for everyone to have one of these devices, creating exclusion for people who actively choose not to use them or for those who cannot afford them, raising concerns about equitability. What about the privacy issues that come alongside the development of brain-computer interfaces? If our minds are able to connect to cloud-based systems, then what happens if that information becomes leaked or public? What if it's sold? Would we feel comfortable having this information out there? What about our autonomy? These devices could progress to the point where they can make decisions for us. Although it would likely be for something harmless, such as monitoring glucose levels and automatically inserting insulin to individuals with diabetes, we must ask, would those people remain self-governing? Would we eventually get to a point where none or very few of decisions we make are actually actively chosen by us? It also has the potential to go seriously wrong. People with mood disorders could implement a BCI in order to help monitor and regulate their emotions, but with the system, it could lead to them not being able to experience any negative emotion at all, even at times where something like sadness might be considered necessary, such as a funeral. Is this right for us to pursue? But it can get worse than just losing your emotion. What if these implants are broken into or accessed by hackers or people with malicious intent? What happens to you as a conscious being? Yes, there are benefits to this tech, like giving people back abilities like movement, but we could also take that away. As the tech advances, the wrong people could eliminate your ability to move, your ability to be happy, your ability to sleep, and your ability to virtually do anything. Tampering with your mind could be detrimental to you as a human being. You could be a slave to these people, and by that point, it would be out of your control and you wouldn't be able to do anything to help yourself. Of course, right now, this is all just speculation and it's a bit extreme. The technology is new and there's a chance that these issues won't even ever come up. However, these arguments, even if they seem far-fetched, are things that we have to consider and look into in order to ensure that these devices are handled with the proper regulations and care. As we've seen with technology in the past, if we do not adapt to match its progression and integrate it into our lives under our own terms, it outruns us and leaves us behind anyways. Brain-computer interfaces have the potential to be more superpowered than the computer. This may be the device we need to set us towards the technological singularity and completely change who we are as human beings. This is the tool that might send us to the next revolution. The only question being, should we let it?